Welcome to Business Infrastructure, the podcast about curing back office blues of fast-growing businesses. If you're a business owner or operator looking for practical tips and solutions to scaling your business in a sustainable manner, you're in the right place. Now here's your hostess, Alicia Butler-Pierre. Hello and welcome to the Business Infrastructure Show, where we share tips and resources to help you cure back office blues. I'm your hostess, Alicia Butler-Pierre, and I'm honored to be joined today by Corey Blake. Corey is the founder of Roundtable Companies. Prior to starting his company, Corey starred in one of the 50 greatest Super Bowl commercials. His work playing basketball naked earned Belding, Addy, and Cannes Awards. Corey helps leaders write the book they were born to write. He's pioneered business comics with Tony Shea and Marshall Goldsmith, and he's created the Vulnerability Wall and the Vulnerability is Sexy card game. He's a sponsor of Conscious Capitalism, as well as the publisher of Conscious Capitalism Press. And speaking of Conscious Capitalism, Corey's going to actually share with us today the one thing we need to know about it from a business infrastructure perspective. So, Corey, without any further ado, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm wonderful, Alicia. It's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Now, I was telling you before we actually started the interview that I was looking over your website, I was watching all of the videos, and I was thinking to myself, wow. What an incredibly diverse background. So you're an actor, a storyteller, a publisher. Can, you, can we start off, rather, with you first telling us more about what you do at Roundtable Companies? Sure. Uh, it's kind of morphed over time, but, um, but the way that we frame it now is that we, we help businesses to solve complex challenges through storytelling. So we're always looking through the lens of uh, how, the, how storytelling impacts the human beings that power organizations, and uh, and now we're working really to to do it at scale. Right? How can we have the the largest impact and the greatest ripple with the work that we're doing? And we find working with larger organizations where there is conscious leadership. Leadership by that I mean leadership that's really worked on their own personal development and is working on the development of the organization. That that's where we tend to have the greatest impact. Hmm, that's a really nice segue into actually defining what conscious capitalism actually means. So before you tell us the one thing we need to know about it, can you first define exactly what that is? Absolutely. And, and I do share this from my perspective. I'm, I'm, um, I, I'm an avid um, enthusiast of conscious capitalism and somewhat influential within the movement. Um, and I have my, write my own interpretation, as we all do, of the things that we, we encounter. So, so from my perspective, the way that, that it's really landed on me is that conscious capitalism is all about uh, doing well for the world while you're doing good as an organization. Right. So it's not entirely profit line, uh, bottom line driven, although profit is a really important and necessary ingredient to having impact, it can't be the only thing. When it's the only thing, we're willing to sacrifice uh, the good of our people, the good of our planet, et cetera. So this is really um, capitalism where there is a greater sense of balance for the overall and ensuring that we're, uh, we're not harming the world as we are trying to grow our organizations. Mm. Now, if you had to say that there's one thing we need to know about conscious capitalism, what would that one thing be? Uh, if, you, if you are someone who is in your business to have long-term sustainability and impact, conscious capitalism, that approach to business is the winning formula. Hands down, bottom line, it has been proven over and over again. Uh, there are a number of books about it, uh, but uh, the returns for conscious organizations are monumentally greater than other companies. How do you know if a company is actually conscious? I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, I, I heard you say that, you know, it starts obviously with the people in, in leadership positions, but overall, how would you know to describe a particular company as being, you know, conscious, I guess? <laughs> yeah, it's really tricky language, right? Because I think at, at the end of the day, the way that I talk about it, um, is that is that none of us are are fully conscious organizations it 's really it 's all aspirational and and most of us in business we have 
certain lines of development where we're more conscious than others. So an easy example is to say that um, I might be somebody who really preaches conscious capitalism, but if you looked at my stock portfolio, is it all investments in conscious companies or am I sometimes investing in companies that are potentially harming the planet because I know I can get a nice return. Am I in alignment consciously? Well, no, in that area, I might be out of alignment, but in other areas, I might be a really conscious communicator. I might have conscious agreements for my organization that don't set up win-lose relationships, but actually set up win-win relationships, et cetera. So there's all these different ways in which we can be a conscious organization. So I think the way that I look at it is that a conscious organization is an organization that cares about those questions and is actively engaged in responding to as many of those as it's capable of at any given time. Mm. I'm, I, I'm thinking, as I'm listening to you, I'm, I'm thinking about this book that I read called The Goal. Are you familiar with that book? I don't think I am. Okay. And it's, it's a book about continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's written in the form of a novel. And the, the, the actual goal, and the author says this is the goal of any for-profit company, is to make money. And I think sometimes it's very difficult to, to strike that balance that you're talking about, especially as companies grow larger and larger. And even for those, once they, you know, have an IPO and they are now officially public, where the, the emphasis may go from pleasing customers to pleasing shareholders. Um, so it's, it's really interesting listening to you because that's been the mantra I think for so long is, hey, the goal is to make money and almost and, and by any means necessary type of mindset. But what mm -hmm. you're saying is, you know, we have a, you know, obviously we're in an ever-changing society. Things are evolving constantly around us. We have multiple generations now in these work work uh, places, and so <clears throat> companies that are actively asking certain questions that matter are at least on the right track to becoming um, con conscious capitalists. Is is that a correct way of looking at it? Yeah, I believe so. And, and I think what you're highlighting is, is absolutely accurate. The larger an organization gets, I think the more challenging typically it is to be a conscious organization because the more you have to lose, uh, I think the, right, the, the, the more that um, a board can get pretty nervous around potentially a more vulnerable approach to being honest about the way some things are in order to change them, right? So, <laughs> so it's not unusual in, in my experience that as we work with larger companies, it takes a tremendously courageous leader or a number of people on a leadership team to, to really hold a company in the space of conscious capitalism because you're, you're, you're right on target. You know, the stocks particularly are set up typically for short-term gains on a quarterly basis and mm -hmm. they, they don't reward the long-term outlook. So there are certainly, there are impact investment groups that look at, at these investments in an entirely different fashion than a traditional stockholder might, for example, where they, they might look at a 10 year time horizon or a 20 year time horizon as, a, as opposed to maybe a, a two to three to five year time horizon where people want to get in, make a bunch of money and leave. So it is a, a different mindset. Um, but at the end of the day, I think what, what um, continues to be proven is that companies that do hang in there for the long haul, they not only produce dramatically better results, but they have a far greater positive impact on the lives of their people, which then ripples out into the impact that it's had on the world. I like the fact that you were talking about the specific types of people that are required because, you know, with this show, we talk about business infrastructure and it's for those who are listening for the first time, this business infrastructure is simply a system for how you link your people processes and tools to ensure that growth happens in a profitable and sustainable way. Now, Corey, you were talking about the types of people that are required to, I guess, to embody this idea of conscious capitalism. Can we talk about some of the processes and tools that you use with your clients as you, well, first of all, how, how do you actually work with your clients in helping them? Is this a, a principle or, or is it a, a concept, a mindset? Is it about company culture, this idea of conscious capitalism? 
So uh, conscious capitalism is really like a um, um, somewhat, you could say, of an operating system, right? Okay. So, so, so it's not specific to any industry. We happen to be in the, the, the business of supporting uh, business solutions, right, through storytelling. Some people view us as a marketing company. Some people view us as a publishing company. We, so we do a lot of book work. We do a lot of documentary film work. We do a lot of culture work where we're actually helping to go into an organization and, and gain access to what are the, what's the storytelling ecosystem that exists around this organization, whether they're intentional about it or not. What, what are the stories that the customers are hearing and telling and piecing together? And are they in service to where the organization is, is authentically trying to go? Or are they potentially creating a tug of war, right? By pulling energy in the opposite direction because the story is not authentic to who the company actually is. And we come in and, and support the revision of that, um, like I said, authentically, so that it's in alignment with the organization, but it, it kind of changes the overall electricity within an organization. We try to do it as consciously as we can so that is kind of like a, an overall methodology. But we typically are coming in, and one of our first things that we're doing with an organization of any kind or even an individual thought leader, which we also we work with individuals as well, is to really take a, a hard look at what they stand for and how do we get into the guts of what they stand for as opposed to an intellectual understanding that looks great hanging on a wall but doesn't actually make anyone feel anything. We want to get into really the nuts and bolts um, like I say, the guts of what is a company here to do in the world. And you can kind of think of it like um, I'm a believer that every entrepreneur, every business owner is an artist and they're painting a version of the world that they wish to see. The canvas just happens to be their business. So we're working to get in and get into the psyche and the underbelly of what is the art that that organization is working to create in the world. Once we understand and have the language for what that is, then there's all kinds of ways we can use storytelling to amplify and project that out into the world so that their people see them it becomes a beacon for the organization. And then that has all kinds of incredible impact to the company. And then of course, outwardly towards its customers. Now, one of the tools that I noticed from looking at your website is your vulnerability wall. Is that, is that a tool that you use when you're working with your clients it certainly can be. So, or okay. versions, or versions thereof. So, we, we do the vulnerability wall is um, is something that we utilize a lot at events. So, uh, it, essentially, people come into this event space. Some kind of conference could be anywhere from a couple hundred people to forty thousand people. We've done events for, and people are coming into the space, and there's this gargantuan, usually a black wall or a white wall, and it's just blank with a question on it, and. Uh, Oftentimes it's something with a kind of a vulnerable nature to it. And it's like, for example, people might come into the conference and the question might be, what are you feeling vulnerable, vulnerable about in your life or your work as you're entering the conference? And they'll fill out a card anonymously. Don't have to put their name on it. They drop it into a box. And then when it, they come back later to the art installation, our artists have turned their submission into a piece of art on this wall. By the end of it, it might have 100, 200, 300 entries that become this beautiful human expression of the community of people at this event. And the whole goal around that is to remove the hierarchy that happens in our brains when we get into an event or conference space, which is a lot of comparison stuff. It's a lot of, you know, just the yucky stuff that goes in. Am I, am I farther along than this person? Is that person farther than me? Do I even belong here? All that stuff that makes us separate. We eliminate that. We get into the human stuff that people are bringing in that makes us all the same. And we find that when we do that quickly at an, at an event or throughout an event, we create an uh, environment where people are willing to take greater human risks as they connect with other people while they're there. It's so awesome. And I, I remember seeing a video that had, gave a demonstration of that vulnerability wall exercise. So it's really fascinating to see it all unfold. Do your clients usually keep that wall? And yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it always breaks everyone's heart when there's some reason that they can't, but it's very seldom that they can't. The first, the very first, uh, one of the very first ones that we did was at a Hyatt hotel 
um, for actually for conscious capitalism. Conscious capitalism did not have a way of keeping it. We found out three years later that Hyatt kept it and they put it in the training room of that Hyatt at Lost Pines. Oh, in wow. And it's still there and it, it's actually part of their training program. We've done walls for Microsoft and ADP where they bring them back to their home campus and show them off and keep them as a permanent art installation because it, it also captures a moment in time, the story of an experience, right, that happened and people love to come back to that and be able to get immersed back into whatever happened during that time together. So yeah, it's, it's not unusual that people certainly want to commemorate and save those and put them in, install them somewhere. We also do them um, not just at events, but what we're starting to do them more and more at organizations themselves where we'll do something permanent within a retail space or permanent within an office space. Well, we need to take a quick break. And when we come back, I'd love for you to share with us some resources that you recommend um, you know, for people who want to learn more about conscious capitalism. Today's episode is brought to you by The Process Shop. What if you could build your operations manual in less than a day? Well, that's possible with accounting process and procedure templates from The Process Shop. These templates can help you standardize work, offer transparency, and remove guesswork as you train new people. Why start from scratch and spend hours of time you don't have to create processes when you can start with a template and customize it to your specific needs? Get started today. Visit eqbsystems.com forward slash shop. That's eqbsystems.com forward slash shop. And we are back with Corey Blake. Corey, before that quick commercial break, you were telling us about more about what conscious capitalism actually is and the one thing that we need to keep in mind about it. And I'm wondering if you can share with us some resources where we can learn even more about conscious capitalism. Of course. Um, so there's a phenomenal book called Conscious Capitalism written by John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods, and Raj Sisodia, who's the co-founder of Conscious Capitalism. Uh, there's another book called Uncontainable by Kip Tyndall, the founder of the Container Store. He's one of the very early uh, collaborators with John Mackey and Raj, and he's uh, now the co-chair of Conscious Capitalism, phenomenal human being. Uh, we just released through Conscious Capitalism Press, for people who want to uh, look at something more recent, a book called It's About Time. It's by a gentleman named Safwan Shah. And he's solving the paycheck to paycheck crisis in America and doing it brilliantly and at scale to move $3 billion this year into the hands of hourly workers between paychecks. Um, very conscious organization looking to do things holistically and right for the consumer and doing it at scale. Um, and I'll offer uh, one more uh, that we've created, uh, which is around this. Uh, what, there are four pillars to conscious capitalism. One of them is higher purpose, which is essentially asking that question, what do you stand for? And on our website at roundtablecompanies.com slash purpose, uh, we offer a guided experience for people to unpack uh, and bypass the intellectual approach to what they stand for, but kind of get into their own guts. And they can find that there at roundtablecompanies.com slash purpose. Can you tell us what those the other three pillars are? So you mentioned higher purpose as one of the four pillars. What are the other three? A stakeholder orientation, meaning that um, all of the stakeholders within an organization need to be in a winning position in doing work with that organization. Right? So the old command and control model, uh, it's not unusual for an organization to not care if its vendors go out of business. They just replace their vendors. So sometimes they squeeze them. Oftentimes they might squeeze them for pricing, et cetera. A stakeholder orientation model is all about how do we help ensure that the tide indeed lifts for everyone as we are growing this thing we all do together, um, all stakeholders included. So how do we create that winning model? Uh, conscious leadership and then conscious culture are the other two pillars. Conscious leadership specific to the capacity of an organization expands at the same degree that uh, the capacity of, of leadership does. Right. So if I am not developing my own capacity as a human being, my ability to further understand my own motivations, my behaviors, my triggers, all of that, if I'm not doing that work, it's very hard for the organization to raise um, its own level of uh, awareness right around how it's impacting the world. So conscious leadership is that focus on, uh, on individual leadership within an organization and conscious culture being um, how are we taking care of the whole, all of the, uh, employees within an organization, all of the uh, all the folks who make up what that culture is, what does that culture stand for? What is that? What is important and and uh, decisive? Uh, creating the decision making for that 
for that culture? Are there a set of core values that people don't chuck aside when they become inconvenient, which is kind of typically how people approach core values, right? What, do they, what is this company willing to stand for when it gets tough? And how do they work with their people to ensure that they do, right, to support them in, uh, in behaving in alliance with those core values when they'd really, really love to just uh, pack them in a closet and be rude to someone because someone's been rude to them, for example. Hmm. Now, speaking of tools again, you mentioned, or I'm sorry, in the bio, I mentioned that you have a vulnerability card game. Can you tell us a little bit more about that as well? Is that something that we could just purchase? And, it and is. Yeah. Maybe, okay, cool. Yeah, definitely tell us yeah. more about that. Yeah, so, so you know, we were really born as a book writing company. That was the first iteration of our organization for many years. And we help people to write the book they're born to write, which is not an information product of here's what I've learned, but a more of a who I am product. So that requires a tremendous amount of vulnerability and, and takes a year to a year and a half to, to do with people. We have to continue to deepen the trust between the client and ourselves through that process. So they start saying things aloud they've never even said to themselves before, right? So in that process, we recognized how do you create a safe space for that vulnerability to occur in an expedited fashion as much as possible. And eventually we carried that over to the vulnerability walls to do that at events. But as you can imagine, both of those are high priced ticket items. You know, a, a collaborative team working around someone to burr the book is not inexpensive putting together a wall where we've got materials, we're flying artists around the country. It's not as expensive as a book, but it's not inexpensive. And so we asked the question, what can we produce that can help people in their offices and in their homes to have uh, an intimate experience where they truly are listening to one another in a deep fashion. And so we created the game, everything around the structure of the game first off invites people to meet the game where they are. So they get to choose the level of vulnerability they're comfortable with. And secondly, it's set up in a deep listening structure um, where people, for example, there's no circular flow to the game, right? So, so the next play is determined uh, through a selection of a card. It might be the person across from you. You might get to go again. It might be the person with the brightest clothing in the room. What that does is it helps ensure that people are simply paying attention and listening as opposed to going off into their own heads and starting to think, okay, two people for now, it's my turn. It's going to be my turn next. We stop listening to each other. There's a number of mechanisms mm. within the game that promote truly being with one another and also not fixing each other, not judging each other, um, and being truly present, all the things that help us feel heard as a human being. And I'll tell you, Alicia, when I watch people, we, we do, I mean, people play it you know, in their own privacy, but when we see it happen at events with a couple hundred people, I, I watch a room of people fall in love with one another in five minutes flat to the degree that once the game is over and they're free to do whatever they, they want to do with the rest of their night, people won't move for 30 minutes minimum because hmm. they're so connected to the people that they've been playing with. That's amazing. Now, is this something that we can purchase through your website? Yes, absolutely. Vulnerability is Sexy is the name of the game, and people can find it at roundtablecompanies.com. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. You can find it through, we have a Shopify shop. So if you just go type in vulnerability is sexy to Google, you'll, you'll happen upon it in a number of different fashions. You can purchase through the, the outlet that works best for you. Okay. Now for those who may be listening and they're thinking, wow, I really need to get in touch with Corey and, and connect with him. What's the best way for people to do that? Um, certainly through roundtablecompanies.com. Uh, there are a number of giveaways that we offer on our website as value for people. Um, there's also you know, just ways to get in touch with us. Um, there's a contact button right on our website. Um, through social media, you can find me on Twitter, at Corey Blake 9000 Find me uh, on Instagram, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, and our companies in all those places as well. We'd love to hear from folks. Awesome. Well, Corey, thank you so much. This was very enlightening for me. And I should, uh, you know, should probably mention when you were talking about John Mackey, um, I have a business school professor who at one time was the chairman of the board at Whole Foods. And he mm. would always talk about, his name is Dr. John Elstrott. Mm -hmm. And he would always talk about conscious capitalism. He also talked a lot about intrapreneurship. Mm. Um, so, so very interesting that, um, how this is all kind of coming full circle, at least for me, mm. um, because I never, 
Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, but thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to speak with me today. I really appreciate it. Oh, likewise, Alicia. What a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And now that we've heard from Corey, what are your thoughts about conscious capitalism? Chances are you may be a conscious capitalist and you just never realized that that was your title. How can you leverage some of the principles that Corey shared with us to better operate your business? As a reminder, Corey told us that conscious capitalism is an operating system that ensures that we don't harm the planet as we grow our businesses. And though it may be aspirational, it is something that we can make a conscious effort to put in place. He also talked to us about the types of people that are needed to ensure a conscious capitalism and that it permeates throughout the entire company or organization. You have to have courageous leaders who are definitely in it for the long haul. Conscious capitalism can also change the electricity of our companies. I love the way Corey said that. And as far as processes and tools, he talked to us about a very specific methodology that his company employs in implementing a conscious comp capitalism construct within these different companies. As a leader, we are painting our version of the world that we wish to see, and our businesses are merely our canvases. That was also another great takeaway from Corey. And lastly, he shared with us the four pillars of conscious capitalism, higher purpose, stakeholder orientation, conscious leadership, and conscious culture. If you want to know more about conscious capitalism, the vulnerability is sexy card game, having a vulnerability wall maybe at your next business event or even have Corey and his organization come into your, your business, definitely reach out to him at roundtablecompanies.com. And as a reminder, he did say that he is also accessible via Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. As a reminder, we will have links to all of these resources that Corey shared in the show notes at businessinfrastructure.tv. Did you know we have a YouTube channel? Yep, that's right. You can find this show as well as other how-to videos on YouTube. Just go to businessinfrastructure.tv and look for the link. When you get to our channel, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell so that you'll know when the next episode airs. Thank you so much for tuning in. And remember, stay focused, be encouraged. This entrepreneurial journey is a marathon and not a sprint. Until the next time. Thank you for listening to Business Infrastructure, the podcast about curing back office blues with Alicia Butler-Pierre. If you like what you've heard, do us a favor and subscribe, leave a rating and review, and more importantly, share with your colleagues and team members who could benefit from the information. Join us next week for another episode of Business Infrastructure with Alicia Butler-Pierre.